Hello, and welcome to Building Perspective, this new World GPC series where I will be interviewing amazing leaders to talk to us about the global sustainable built environment movement and how they're forging the way. They are gonna be sharing with us their expertise and we're gonna be finding ways to further collaborate and discuss top of mind sustainability ch challenges that we face as a sector. And more interestingly, we'll have a chance to hear their human stories behind their success and why they are being these leaders that are catalyzing sustainable buildings for everyone everywhere. My name is Cristina Gamboa. I'm the CEO of the World Green Building Council. And today I am thrilled to kick off this series with none other than Julie Hirigoyen. She is the CEO of the UK Green Building Council, and she is a seasoned leader driving a more sustainable built environment in the UK. And it's my pleasure to have you here today to hear about your unique building perspective. Thank you so much for joining me today, Julie. How are you? I'm good, thank you, Christina. I'm um, energized from a sunny weekend. Um, I'm looking forward to this interview and I'm really delighted to be your first guest. Very honored. Oh, no, thank you. It's my pleasure. So let's start with your personal journey. If um, I've always been very inspired every time I get to speak to you and I guess, I guess our audience will too, to hear more of where do you find your energy, your passion? What drives your attention? How do you work? How do you go about the challenges in our movement? So starting with that and your personal and, and reflecting on your personal leadership journey, if you like, what do you think are the types of attributes and qualities that is needed for sustainable leadership? Yeah, it's um, I, look, I think any type of leadership um, requires similar attributes, but I think sustainability leadership really requires more courage and humility and empathy. Um, uh, I often say on our leadership programs, you know, some of these values and attributes are that much more important, I think, in a sustainability context. And um, just to give you some examples. So on the empathy side, you know, I think that we can be all too easily uh, judgmental or perhaps critical of those who don't share our viewpoints. Um, or who perhaps don't see the urgency and the scale of the challenge that we see. Um, so I think it's really, really important that we practice, a, a, that we are compassionate about the kind of different realities and different viewpoints that we encounter. And on the courage side, I think, um, you know, we clearly need to push boundaries further, faster. And we need to be, I often say, um, in, anyone in a sustainability world ought to be prepared to lose their job uh, regularly. So, you know, <laughs> And we need to be prepared to be uh, um, unpopular for some of the things that we're pushing and, um, you know, really kind of overcoming the status quo, which is which is not always an easy place to be, right? right? Yeah, that's right. And I, I really like that word, right? Courage. Mm. <laughs> because uh, pushing further the envelopes and asking and revisiting paradigms is also key for the sustainability journey, I guess. Mm. And And of course... The GBC movement was very much in touch with climate leadership and sustainability, of course, is, 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 is key to delivering on climate leadership. But in terms of going into the sector of the built environment, well, how do you see how do how do you see the leadership shaping up? And from your personal experience, beyond those those descriptions you just shared with, with us, what does it look like genuinely for them to have to the, the, the sort of leadership have a true impact? Yeah, I think um, it's evolving. So I would say that, um, you know, these days now, the pressure is on business leaders in particular to sort of set their ambitions um, really high, as in, you know, the, the, the net zero um, before 2050 on all scopes is absolutely kind of almost expected. And so thinking about leadership would look beyond that, right? And, um, and I think... Um, you know, business leaders need to be thinking where they're trying to get their organization. They need to be setting the vision far out and actually setting um, what we sometimes call in, in the UK, big, hairy, audacious goals, BHAGs, you know, things that they don't necessarily know how they're going to meet, um, but really kind of challenging themselves to think beyond you know, what, what, what good looks like. Um, and I think you know, we really need to bring it back to kind of... Uh, this is a full-blown systemic transformation. 
So wherever um, you know they're thinking we can do this with business as usual and just kind of reduce and improve a little bit, that that's not going to that's not going to work. So I think it's you know for all the, the leaders out there need to really challenge themselves to think further than they would naturally think um, or, or set the bar much higher than they naturally would otherwise. That, that that's where the courage bit comes in, right? Um, yeah. Okay, so in the sustainable built environment movement, right? How do you think that individual sense of personal purpose can be brought together and aggregate, aggregated in a way that we can create further impact and be more than just individual sum of our parts? It's a really, it's a really big question, isn't it? I mean, I think actually working in this space, I feel, um, more connected to um, others, you know, I feel very lucky to feel more connected to others working in this same space because of that common purpose. So I think, you know, if, if one has a vision of a sustainable built environment and, and ours is one that allows or that enables people and planet to thrive, you know, that everyone can sort of get behind that. And there are so many different dimensions to that, that actually it can attract lots of different individuals who have slightly different personal purposes but into is something that's much much bigger than than the sum of the parts and i have found that really powerful in the last well particularly the last 12 to 18 months as we've been in this very difficult situation with the pandemic you know certainly uh, um it's given me my personal drive and motivation to keep going but but i've also really sensed that across my team across other gbc teams and your team I, I really feel like we're all sort of coming together with a very common mission and agenda, and that's giving us a really sort of strong collective purpose. So I think we're very, very fortunate. I think it's really exciting that the uh, movement is growing and so rapidly globally, and that gives us all this sense of being connected to something much, much bigger than what we're doing on our own. An excellent interview, a fascinating interview you gave to Property Week in November 2020. And actually, you were discussing one one of um, you were reflecting on the impact on the pandemic, on the yeah. climate agenda, and and yeah, and you were you were describing also on working with leaders, setting at an ambition uh, vision, but some are still not there yet, right? Some business leaders may feel this is not the time to address sustainability issues, and maybe are not focusing, <laughs> no, on on the mm -hmm. on the crises that are looming in the horizon, so. You were saying, and I would like to hear your view on this, uh, how can we continue to leverage the times we're living, um, turn those difficulties into opportunities? It kind of seems like it's an opportunity of a lifetime. How can we drive deep change and transformation? And what would be your message to those leaders that are kind mm -hmm. of not maybe taking action? So I think, I mean, I honestly don't think we can doubt any longer um, the, the business leaders are choosing, you know, short term survival over long term sustainability kind of goals um, during this pandemic. All the evidence I've come across um, in this past year and continue daily to be uh, collecting is showing that that's not the case. I think um, just to give you some examples to back that up, you know, our membership at UKGBC grew by 16 percent last year. And that's unprecedented in all of our 12 years of existence. And that, that to, to me, that means more and more organizations and businesses, a lot of that is businesses, um, recognizing the urgency of this challenge and growing numbers actually of our members, um, new members were non-built environment actors like banks, law firms, pension funds. So that I think shows a market shift as well in terms of the recognition of, you know, the urgency of, of this sector. Um, but also we've got, you know, we doubled the number of UK businesses that signed up to the World GBC Net Zero Carbon Buildings commitment in that same year. Um, and that's just, I, I think a lot of that's not just UK, right? Um, I, I know on a recent call with other GBC CEOs that you curated, you know, lots claimed much more than 75%, I think, claimed that the past year had led to more positive outcomes than they had been expecting. So I think um, there was an interview actually just over the weekend I, that I came across with Paul Pullman, who was the old CEO, previously CEO of Unilever. Um, okay. And he talked about, you know, this is the time when moral leaders will separate themselves from from greenwashers um, and people are really starting to realize that that the cost of inaction is much 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 higher than the cost of action and i guess several are trying to find what's what would be a great 
agenda to to get there and and uh, Julie, you studied law and you also uh, worked <laughs> for for a while at JLL and you also shaped up their sustainability agenda launching building for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And you shaped up the agenda that is driving a, a company like JLL forward still today. So I guess I, I would also would like you to share with our audience. Um, there, there's a lot of people coming into sustainability and climate action, even in infrastructure sectors and many other sectors. What's your perspective from, from the law perspective? You were mm -hmm. also mentioning firms uh, joining UKGBC. Yeah. What, how has that influenced your work? And why are, is it relevant to engage more multi-stakeholders and diversity of professions in, in the times we're living? Actually, in the time that I did it, environmental law was really about getting big firms, big polluters out of loopholes. So I wasn't very uh. excited by going down that route. Um, since then, I think so much has changed. You know, that was back in the 90s, right? So we've now not just got lots, lots more environmental and social regulation, which of course, you know, that's the rule of law. Um, but I think law, law is really important to that systemic change that I was sort of referencing before. So you know, these leaders have to find ways of pushing boundaries, breaking new ground, doing things that haven't been done before. And to do that, we need to um, have legal input into transforming our business models. And I think, you know, a good example of that is the very traditional, conventional and slightly confrontational uh, leasing law that we have in the UK, um, you know, which traditionally would see the landlord and tenant hardly ever speaking or com communicating, hardly ever sort of, um, you know, connecting. And, and really, we need to transform that into a partnership agreement where they're both responsible for working together to improve the performance of the asset over time, right? That's one good example where law could really come and help with some of that. We can't really do it with the antiquated structures that we had. So, so I think it's really important to business innovation in a way to, to have that legal input. And I, I have been really inspired recently by organizations like Client Earth and others that are using the courts to hold businesses and governments to account. So we had this example, didn't we, a couple of months ago where the French government was taken, was found guilty of failing to address the climate crisis and not keeping That's its right. promises to tackle climate change. I think we're going to see more of that. You know, there's this law on ecocide, um, which many campaigners are trying to bring in for big businesses and so on. So I think we will see more of that and that accountability will be really important. I guess from, from the side of, of advocacy and business innovation in the times we're living, um, we know today that around the world, eh, there's been national governments driving net zero commitments to decarbonize their economies. There's a lot of, of commitments uh, in the global south. Uh, the issues are around resiliency, around adapting to risks, facing, facing uh, uh, infrastructure, but also understanding that better solutions uh, drive quality of life high. And, and it's a way to go about the challenges we face as humanity uh, increasingly uh, living in cities. And in, um, in, in, in more developed countries, of course, there is a big push for full decarbonization as quicker as possible, because as you said, it's an agenda for growth, right? Climate mm -hmm. action is an agenda for business growth. Um, in this space where climate science is also telling us that it's, it's, it's not doing a little bit less harm, it's about really contributing significantly to, mm -hmm. to the climate agenda. How do you see business today leading the way into a decarbonized uh, sector for infrastructure? So as a, as a purpose-led sort of charity, we've, we've evolved our theory of change at UKGVC a, a few times. Um, and our latest version of that puts business right at the heart of, the, of, of our theory of change. So I, I, you know, the direct answer to your question is I see business as absolutely critical um, to achieving decarbonization. Um, and and I, I'll, I'll um, summarize our theory of change. Um, it, it basically says at UKGVC, we collaborate to advocate, enable, and inspire accelerated leadership and action, primarily by business and government, on the issues that we care about, climate change, resource use, nature and biodiversity, social value, health and well-being, and so on. Now, the reason why business is right at the heart of the theory is not to say that government policy and regulation isn't important, which of course it is, it will bring up the, the rear and, and set minimum standards, but um, 
but we can't wait for government to address some of these issues with the urgency that, uh, that they're needed to make a difference. So um, one of my mantras coming into GBC from the private sector, from the JLL and, and, and so on, was we need the policy frameworks, of course, to create the level playing field. But while we strive for that, we have to support, inspire, encourage, enable leadership amongst the businesses. Otherwise, we won't get there fast enough. Actually, on that point, Julie, I'm very, I'm very interested in hearing how is UKGBC cultivating that leadership within your membership and 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 the wider industry. How do you go about that? Well, we've we've um, we've got a number of different programs and, and initiatives that we run just to do that. So leadership, and you'll have heard from that theory of change, is is right at the heart actually of of what we think needs to be done. We need to accelerate leadership and action. You can't really have one without the other. Um, so let me give you some um, some practical examples. So we run a leaders network, um, which is uh, it's about 170 and counting CEOs, board level executives, unapologetically sort of strict kind of inclusion criteria for that network um, that we invite people onto um, from our members from our membership. Um, and that's very much aimed at sort of, of course, peer to peer networking, sharing stories and inspiration and sustainability leadership and and so on. But increasingly and looking forwards, we're, we're looking to make that slightly more challenging, slightly more sort of participatory and slightly more sort of um, reflective, in fact, for those individuals to think carefully about what's their personal contribution, their personal purpose, their legacy um, in this space. And, and, you know, they are today's decision makers. This can't be left to tomorrow's. You know, one often says future generations they're going to sort this all out. That's not fair. You know, so whilst they're still in office, these CEOs and CFOs and COOs and so on can, can make a difference. And we're really trying to sort of encourage them, put, nudge them to do that and to show them what, what others are doing. So that's one thing. Um, and then we run three different types of leadership programs as well. One for future leaders, which is you know, young, um, high-performing, high high-potential talent. Um, uh, who are sort of maybe five to 10 years into their careers, one for more kind of middle managers or heads of change, heads of diversity, heads of sustainability, we call that the change accelerator, really there to give them a bit of a turbo boost in their kind of change management um, strategy. And then Recalibrate is our leadership program for the C-suite kind of executives. And that's as much about really driving their sort of sense of personal purpose and getting them to articulate a point B for their business. Uh, how can I take it to a different place? There's a there's a podcast that sort of got me through this lockdown, this current lockdown, which mm -hmm. is by Jane Goodall. And um, she said she she calls it a hope cast. Um, and she sees changing people's hearts as that critical route to action. So I think that heart thing is really important, telling stories and accessing people um, in that way. Hi really important. I love that. I love that because that's uh, that's the sort of connections that really are meaningful for inspiration too, right? Yeah. It's, it, we're, we're humans too. And we, 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 together we get um, better through tough times. And that's amazing. All those leadership networks you have, that's really, really inspiring. And it also makes, makes it just very evident the power of of the ideas that that UKGBC is also driving through in terms of engaging and activating all those actors that are supporting the cause if you like yeah. huh? and so in that sense i would like to go to an initiative that uh, it's called the net zero carbon buildings commitment that world gbc started over 3 years ago and um and it kind of feels it's the year of 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 the commitment but i would like to hear from you uh, what what has it been? What has been the role of the Net Zero Carbon Buildings Commitment for you, KGBC? And of course, there has been a, a significant hurdle or no to pass for uptake, yeah. but it's kind of shifting. It's kind of shifting. It kind of goes to what you're saying about business models and the sense of urgency and acting. So I would like to hear from you. What is it yeah. for you, KGBC, and and what do you see the future of the commitment? So um, I think the commitment's really important because it's, um, you know, it's it's a common kind of goal that we can all align around globally, which is which is always super helpful, I think. Um, so we've we've picked it up and run with it quite hard, or fast in the UK. We started, up, I, I guess, up until now, we've pushed it quite a lot with our members. Um, 
more in the positioning it, I suppose, as kind of because it's, it's you know, the buildings that you own or occupy or manage being net zero in operation by 2030. We think we as an organisation should commit to that, if not sooner. And you know, any organisation, large and small, owns and occupies some kind of space. So um, we all have a responsibility to almost practice what we preach by signing up to that. I think the challenge it, it has been in the built environment industry for built environment businesses, that's a small part of their footprint, right? Um, their, their occupation and ownership of real estate. So, of course, one needs to go beyond that and they need to commit to lots more too. But it's a start and they can at least, you know, it's their sort of directly controlled emissions from their buildings and, and, that, and that's important. That led us to a place where this year we want to push it much, much harder with occupiers and mm. users of real estate. And that's where I think its real strength is because... Um, you know, like I said, everyone uses space from tiny leased offices to huge giant portfolios of, of, of real estate across you know, the globe. And regardless of sector, um, most organisations need to tackle that bit of their footprint if they're lo looking to go net zero. So I see it as very complementary to their science-based targets. It's, it's, it's effectively um, helping the corporate real estate departments to deliver what they need to deliver for the organisation to go net zero which I think is really powerful. So I have really high ambitions for the commitment this year. I want to push it with um, largely through those organisations that we engage with that, that advise or support corporates. Um, so our agency members, our law firm members, our bank members, they all have big commercial client portfolios and, and they can push it uh, hard with them. Um, I think uh, that, you know, the challenge that we've come up against is just commitment fatigue. And people, you know, are, they see too many different initiatives gaining traction and they think, well, why, why another one? But I still feel for our mission and agenda, this is crucial. For if, if, if enough major corporates signed up to that commitment, then we would have proper market demand in the marketplace for net zero carbon buildings. And that's the bit that's missing. Yeah, exactly. But in, in that space, Julie, what difference is it uh, having that COP26, the UN Climate Change Conference that is going to take place in Glasgow in November 2021, uh, has it made a difference at all in that campaign uh, going forward uh, for UKTPC? We will definitely be leveraging COP26 as a key kind of reason to sign up to the commitment. Um, Again, we're in discussions with the COP office and the climate champions um, that, that, because the number one kind of um, drive, I think, from you know Nigel Topping and, and others is to is to get as many business signatories um, or businesses in in this race to zero um, and non-state actors, you know, as uh, others that are not businesses, so cities and, and so on. So um, I think it's challenging because this this commitment is one aspect of your operations it's not your whole organizational commitment and um, so in that sense it's hard to position it necessarily within race to zero but it's highly complementary and i think we're getting there now yeah. um julie the uk gpc is also involved in building life a campaign that world gpc europe is running and uh, it's basically to ensure that uh, Europe delivers on the EU Green Deal and UKGPC has been supporting the campaign. And the campaign, uh, we were talking about the Net Zero Carbon Buildings Commitment that is mm -hmm. around operational carbon. We are about to release a whole life uh, commitment pathway, no, uh, going into whole life and build a, and a building life is about whole life carbon. Mm -hmm. We know that as we tackle operational, we also have to look at whole life and embodied carbon and other aspects. And I guess I would like to know, what do you think is needed for this vision of whole life a, to be mm -hmm. a reality? And what are you doing at UKGPC about it? I mean, I love the ambition of the project. I think it's um, desperately needed in terms of kind of um, ensuring that all of the key stakeholders are pulling in the same direction um, and that, that, that we're really clear what that sort of end goal looks like, which is this whole life net zero carbon. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's huge. It's enormous. I think there's, of course, lots of, uh, you know, the, the, the way we'll deliver it here in the UK, there's, there's some practical things like modelling the data around 
you know, um, which bits of the sector need to decarbonize by when and how and, and, and so on. All of that's pretty complex stuff. But I think that the key thing that needs to happen and which we're sort of knee deep in at the moment um, at, in the UK is, is um, the stakeholder engagement piece, right? We are a hugely fragmented sector, property and construction. There are hundreds, if not thousands of organizations in this kind of, you know, in, in, in this sector that are all scratching their heads and thinking, well, what should we, what should we be doing? What does net zero mean for us? Um, and there's ever more initiatives that are kind of servicing that fragmentation almost. Um, so whether it's specific things for architects or investors or house builders or investors, you know, bankers or, or what have you, ultimately we need kind of a vision to pull all of that together. Julie, I wanted to ask you, for this year, what are your top three priorities? What what do you, by come December, and uh, what do you want to achieve? Yeah, okay. Well, of course, leveraging COP is a really big one. Um, you know, we're, we're, we have all sorts of exciting plans for, around virtual pavilions, digital conferences, and, and all of that, but really using that moment in time, as I said, to drive up commitment signatories of net zero carbon buildings commitment to launch this whole life carbon roadmap and to really kind of push the whole net zero, advancing net zero program, and also to really um, move forward our work on climate resilience and, and nature-based solutions, which is a key theme of COP. So leveraging COP would be one of my key priorities. How many am I allowed? Three. Um, <laughs> you can have another. <laughs> so, so one other one which is important for us is um, extending our networks locally and regionally. So we're really keen to um, invest in Scotland and, and try and, you know, particularly given COP is taking place in Glasgow um, in November to, you know, there's a whole sort of ecosystem in, in Scotland of property and construction players that we're perhaps less well connected with and, and also really pushing out to other regions and localities around the UK. So not being sort of um, London centric, but really being place based as an organisation um, that that would really help um, drive action, I think. And then the I guess the third is really that point around accelerating leadership and action. So um, a, one good example of that is that we are considering introducing requirements of membership um, for from our members um, and you know that's a good example of can we can we use that to encourage leadership but really drive more action our audience will be very interested in hearing a little bit of advice from you and I guess the final points here are in terms of running a, an NGO as a business why right mm. um, what are the three business lessons you've learned in your seven years long at UKGBC and what advice would you give to the rest of the CEO network of GBCs as they as they face the future? Yeah, I think um, so um, we've touched on some of them actually, but yeah. I think so the first the, I mean, the first big one for me was diversification of income. So, you know, we're all membership organizations as GBCs and that's great. We get membership fees, but we're very vulnerable to cyclical uh, market fluctuations um, and, you know, attrition rates can go up and down and that leaves us quite vulnerable. So um, I think aiming to diversify income and pursuing the growing number of charitable foundations and grant givers that will that, that want to fund some of this work um, is one. Um, the second would be um, the, the, the tapping into these networks of leaders. I think that has been absolutely instrumental for us in terms of uh, really sort of deepening our engagement through key individuals within our membership. And that's now so, so strong and, and, and those relationships are so cemented that um, not just from a kind of relationship management and income preservation point of view, but actually from an impact point of view, those people are driving change. So that has definitely been the second. And then my third, probably my first actually, but my third would be you know, building the best team. I just wanted to say um, from World GBC, we are so proud of having this partnership with you. It, we are very lucky to continue to learn from you, to have uh, your support. Uh, as you know, World GPC is a network of networks, and uh, it's been amazing what we've been achieving also, supporting with your leadership other GPCs and leading this movement globally. 
And so, um, so it's going to be, I, I see it's going to be a great year from your <laughs> priorities and looking forward to catching up again as the year progresses and we share this new series of building perspective. So, yes. So I guess thank you everyone for joining us and we hope you enjoyed the discussion. Thank you. Thank you.